Sam McLeod was the gentleman that built this house. He was born uh, to a Scottish parents in Prince Edward Island. He uh, left school at 16 and, and became a cobbler and then decided to come west. Samuel McLeod leaves the Red River settlement in 1883 and takes a train to Troy or what's now known as Capel. And from there he basically walks up to Prince Albert. He works hard for about 15 or 16 years and in uh, 1898 he sells off his merchandising business and his lumber business and the lumber business was huge and he is now a very very rich man a man rich enough to build a home like Keyhole Castle. It is a very unique looking structure from the outside it's got an outside tower that was typical of the Queen Anne revival style of Victorian architecture it's interesting as I looked at the drawings, I thought the gables and the roof gables, that is, uh, with the decoration and the, the shapes, uh, were reminiscent of things you might see in Amsterdam. And I think there's a Dutch influence here. It's all topped off by a, a clay tile roof. It's closing in on 100 years old, and uh, the tiles look like they were put up yesterday. The turret plus the the tile work and then the, uh, the keyhole windows along the top floor all combined to give it that castle-like uh, look that, that led to the nickname being assigned to it. It's even more uh, special and unique when you're inside. Hi, come on in. This door is quarter cut oak, solid, heavy. It's stood for 100 years and uh, I think it's a good symbol of uh, what Keyhole Castle all about. I'm in the door. Right. We have the door knocker and this is the original door knocker and the doorbell still works. This is the uh, the foyer in the entrance way. So when anyone comes into our home they step in they're a bit excited to be here especially if they haven't seen it before and they step onto the carpet and they look and they wow and they just love it and we love seeing that response and appreciate that we can show it to people. This is the living room, the main sitting area of the house. We have on purpose not put a television in this room, so this is where we meet and visit and listen to the radio on Saturday, Saturday nights. <laughs> it's a gorgeous room, tons of ornate carvings. It's all mahogany uh, woodwork in this room and it's done with a French polish finish which uh, was very labor intensive and, and is almost extinct as far as home finishes go. It's, it's stood the test of time. It's a hundred years later. It's exactly as it was left the day the workmen left in 1911 or 12. It's a, it's a real showpiece of, of the workmanship of the day. The, uh, the flooring uh, throughout the main floor is all quarter cut oak. The uh, exterior windows are all beveled glass. It's backed by columns that uh, open onto the entryway and, and the back part of the house. Window benches surround the uh, outer two walls under which the heaters were installed, so they're warm, cozy places to roost. Uh, this is the fireplace. We were of the understanding it was marble, and about eight years ago when we had the kitchen refinished, a stonemason was in and corrected us. It's not a marble fireplace, it's onyx, and he was quite excited about that. Each of the blocks are cut from a matched source block. The tiles are Italian hand glazed uh, tiles. The, the brass work is all custom fitted. It uh, works like a charm. They obviously knew how to design fireplaces back then. There was a lot of thought that went into designing the room to, to give it that warm feel for the people in it. Uh, it's not, it doesn't feel like you're sitting in a museum. My wife and I had uh, worked for two and a half years in Saskatoon. Uh, left our jobs, traveled for two years in the Pacific and Asia, and came back to Prince Albert for six months to earn some cash to go traveling again. And uh, six months turned into longer. We looked at some houses, this being one of them, but it was way out of our price range, uh, having no money at the time. and. Uh, uh, jobs that we were just starting at and about three months after we started looking around and saw the place 
the then owner uh, approached me in my new law practice to secure a demolition permit for this house and to have uh, portions of the house removed and sold on the sort of antique structural market. Uh, it was quite alarming to us and uh, after he and I talked about whether that would be something I'd be willing to do, we instead uh, discussed how my wife and I could acquire the place. We, we put together a deal and uh, so we moved from my mom and dad's basement to here. When I was little and we used to see the house, we'd think, wow, there it is. And when we, finally, we moved in when we were 20... Six? No, oh, we were 28 years old. Eight? Yeah, we were 28 years old. It was exciting to us. It's, it's neat, after 23 years, we still get that same reaction. You never get tired of walking through that front door. The McLeods, how the stories go, uh, were world travelers, and if they saw something that they liked, they said, let's put it in our house in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. And that might be part of the reason about why, it, why it's so eclectic. It certainly, I think, is, is one of the factors that led the architect of the day who hailed from Chicago to, to incorporate such a variety of styles and features in the home. It is a building of quality, and I think uh, when you have quality, you can be eclectic. If, if quality was lacking, I don't think uh, the, the combination of styles would come together as well. It's the quality that ties this building together. When you look into things about the house, you're often rewarded with surprises. The <laughs> columns in the house are ionic, and it's interesting that on the exterior columns, there are the Roman style where the scrolling is parallel, and in the interior of the house, they've, they've adopted the angular Greek style of ionic columns. Uh, they're very similar, and I wouldn't have known the difference, but for the internet. Uh, as you come in the main floor on the left is uh, the library, and it's, uh, it's the main floor of the turret. There are uh, ivory inlays over the stained glass windows. The mantelpiece in the library is a, a solid slab of, uh, I think it's about eight inch thick English oak with uh, rosewood, yew, and ebony inlays. What we know is it is a plaster fixture finished to look like wood. So it is definitely original. The hardware in the library is all copper as compared to the hardware in the living room, which is all brass. They're identical sets of hinges and, and window closures, but for Mr. McLeod's reasons, known only to, to him, he wanted uh, a different metal and a different finish, so that's what he got. The room itself is uh, is a real retreat. It evokes images of Sam McLeod uh, with a coal fire on in, in frosty evenings in the winter, uh, making his business decisions and uh, uh, running his empire. Everything about Prince Albert, according to McLeod, was second to none. You can see how that period between 1900 and 1910 shaped the city. The most significant buildings along Central Avenue, the McDonald Building, the Knox building, the Old Strand Theatre, these are buildings that were built in that time. Properties were selling at astronomical prices, over a thousand dollar a foot to have property on Central Avenue. Quite a number of large homes were, were constructed uh, in primarily in the East and West Hill areas at that time. Um, this being, I guess, the, the flagship of, of that uh, era. I think that uh, houses generally are not of the quality that Keyhole Castle is. Um, the sort of materials and finishes that are in that house would be found to be too expensive in this day and age. The construction spanned, I believe, two years from 1911 to 1913. Upon completion, Sam and his wife and I believe one son took up residence. I can't even imagine building this back then, especially like how everyone else would have been living. It was just probably last year when I started doing carpentry in school and all that, I just noticed the woodwork. Like before you just kind of grew up and didn't really like see how much it would have taken or anything, but looking at it now, you're just in awe. It's just a shock how they did it. Over the years that we've lived here, we've really enjoyed it as a, both as a home for Connie and myself and, and our son, but also uh, as importantly for a gathering point for our extended families on each side.
When I was younger, I remember Christmas presents and uh, everyone together. Those were always good memories and we'd have Christmas dinner here. We're in our dining room with the Italian leaded glass, stained glass windows, which at evening it's absolutely stunning. Up here, there's 24 karat gold leaf. The wood paneling is mahogany. It's virtually uh, irreplaceable because there are very few mahogany trees that size left in the world. It was built with Central Vac in 1911. It obviously was, was a unique uh, feature for Prince Albert for sure, and there, there was likely not a Central Vac between Winnipeg and Calgary at that time. And the buttons to, electrical buttons to turn it on and off. One of the things that we acquired a number of years ago uh, was a copy of the original architect's blueprints. One of the past owners, she uh, was from Georgia. One of the souvenirs they took back to Georgia with them was the architect's uh, blueprints. And on one of her visits back to Prince Albert, she brought with her the drawings. They're very unique and, and just uh, convey some of the, the intricacies of the home that we weren't even aware of. By and large, the houses remain unchanged in layout, but for uh, a couple of areas, uh, uh, the basement has changed slightly, the, the coal cellar is no longer there, and the water cistern, the, the kitchen when we moved in, had already been redone in the 60s or late 50s. We uh, redid our kitchen five years ago, and we'd really tried to keep with the ambience of the house. The uh, proprietors of the home would have had very little involvement in the kitchen. At the time, it was designed as a very tiny, cramped workspace. We've ended up using some extra space that we freed up with moving a couple of walls and a couple that were moved earlier. We tried to use colors and, and uh, moldings that were consistent with the rest of the house. When I walk from our dining room into the kitchen, I look at it and say, it just looks like it belongs. The staircase, uh, that you mount going up to the second and third floor. Uh, again, is all of uh, quarter cut English oak, and we are told that it arrived uh, pre cut and, and intact uh, on the train, encased in velvet. So uh, I think it caused quite a stir at the train station when it showed up. There is a servant staircase. We, uh, we debated actually uh, doing something with that, but decided that it needed to stay in place as one of the original features of the home. Yeah. It's the door to the uh, servant's staircase. Uh, even the servants had the embellishments of inlay in their door. The uh, ebony and uh, U finishing here and above the lintels. About half of the second floor consists of a master suite. There's a, a very detailed, uh, fully functional fireplace that, that we enjoy often. This door leads into our walk-in closet, but what's really neat about the door is it has, as I'll open it, you'll see, it has a door within a door, and the main door out to the hallway, the closet door, and this makes a three-way mirror. So if you stand in the mirror, <laughs> you can see. So before Mrs. McLeod would go up to a party in the ballroom, she would take one last look. And what amazes us, all the doors will close and open beautifully. It's a very large tub. Uh, it has a, a unique hardware and plumbing system. The water actually fills from the bottom of the tub. I was told recently that that was to protect the modesty of the bather so that the rest of the house couldn't hear that you're running a bath. It would just sort of silently fill. So this is Mrs. McLeod's sitting room. It is off the master bedroom. 
Uh, people have said that she had a full-length mirror on a stand, and history has it that she would have her afternoon teas here. It does face east and south, so it's very warm in the afternoon. It's one of our favorite rooms if you're home alone. It's a wonderful room, very cozy. Uh, behind us, there's it's fretwork that we were told is Turkish in origin and uh, uh, was one of the original installations in the home. It was a difficult art uh, practiced at the time and uh, again an example of Mr. McLeod's love for wood and woodworking and wood products uh, being a lumber baron that he was. The dream of Prince Albert has been one that we could be a great manufacturing uh, a power as well as a natural resource base. Many business folks in this area hoped that uh, navigation uh, up and down the Saskatchewan River would rival the railway in terms of transportation. And so it was a natural uh, step then to think that maybe power could be generated uh, on the North Saskatchewan River. And a project was proposed and it soon became very clear after a couple of years of construction that the engineering plans were faulty. And as that became clearer and clearer, the debentures and the, the funding to support the project dried up. It was a complete disaster that took the city years to recover from. In 1919, the Canadian Bank of Commerce had threatened to foreclose on the city's debentures and their debt, and McLeod personally underwrote uh, the city's line of credit so that the schools could be opened. We're sitting out in the veranda, and it is off the dining room on the north side of the home. This is the exterior brick wall. Originally, it was an open-air veranda. And enclosed about 1940s in the 40s. It's a lovely, cool spot in the summer. It gets the north breezes and then the shady side of the house. There's a heater in it to extend the season a bit into the spring and fall, so it's a, it's a three-season room. Because of the size of the yard, it's surrounded by trees and shrubs, so when you're sitting there, you do feel like you've, you've gotten away somewhere. Originally, um, the, the yard site occupied about a third of a city block, and the, the width is still the same. It's five city lots wide. Uh, to the north, over time, what was the garden and the orchard area had been subdivided off and, and smaller homes constructed on it. It it's, retains a feel of the estate-like quality that I think Sam McLeod originally intended. About four years ago, we were actually re-roofing the carriage house, and uh, we were away out of town on the weekend and uh, got a call, unfortunately, that our carriage house was on fire. Uh, the, uh, the conclusion was that the, the roofing being applied was one of these Tort John products. An ember must have caught and uh, fanned into flames after the workers had left for the nights. We did manage to salvage the exterior brick, which was good. It's a unique type of brick that was fired in Alberta at the time, I believe, and ended up reconstructing a new garage that, that uh, was a fair bit larger, but we faced it uh, in the old brick and tried to get the roof line and, and some of the details to be as sympathetic to the structure as we could. He resided in the home until his passing in 1929, and his widow resided in the home until 1939. Samuel McLeod uh, built, uh, and his family has maintained, what is suspected by many to be the only mausoleum in a Saskatchewan graveyard. There's a, a, a fairly uh, steady procession in the summer of people driving by wanting to have a, a peek. We certainly uh, don't blame people for having some curiosity about this place. It's a, it's a curious place. But we've been very uh, happily uh, surprised by the fact that people don't uh, impose. Maybe that's the polite Saskatchewan way. It was erected in 1913 in the Queen Anne Revival style. And we're, we're from Pinoca, from Alberta. Yeah, central Alberta. We decided to take our vacation uh, touring Saskatchewan. So. Everybody in Alberta tells us there's nothing to see in Saskatchewan, <laughs> but we've been proving them wrong. I was looking at the local map. The tourist map. And 
there's a little dot that says Keyhole, Keyhole Castle. Castle. We thought, it says National Historic Site, so we thought there might be a tour. <laughs> so we just about walked up to the door and they came out and said, it's, it's a private a residence. <laughs> The interior of the building is, a, is a, 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 almost a surprise when you see it. The building from the outside, although somewhat eclectic and varied, as you go to the inside, it becomes very formal with some very interesting uh, woodwork, almost uh, classical woodwork panelling. Um, the balustrades of the staircases are really extremely well done, very high uh, architecture. The whole thing ties together beautifully and indeed it is very deserving of being a National Historic Site. There's a, a fair bit of original wall covering still in the home. Uh, it's in the, the main landing area uh, and the foyer and up into the upper uh, hallway. It's a style of wall covering called Lynn Crusta and it was uh, developed in the late 1800s as a way of uh, simulating a plaster relief type of wall finish at a much lower cost. Ultimately, we'd look to some restoration work to be done on it at some point in time when we locate the expertise and the uh, uh, knowledge to do it. The original carpet goes up to the ballroom. That was the last section of the Axminster carpet. And it is showing where. As you continue up to the third floor, you get to a large domed ceiling room known as the ballroom. Uh, it uh, is striking. It was one of the things that grand homes back in the early teens, uh, 1900s, uh, sometimes had. And there were two or three similar rooms in the city, but nothing with the degree of finishing and, and uh, quality uh, components of, of this room. The mural work was a recent change that we uh, had uh, performed by a local artist, Daniel Dunn. I had uh, just got back from uh, the Middle East. We'd, um, there was uh, five Canadian artists and uh, 13 decorative finishers. And we had done uh, 52 murals for the Shake and Shake of Abu Dhabi. And um, there we weren't allowed to take any photographs of uh, the work that we had done. And we had done this kind of work in her dining room. When I got back, I wanted to reproduce it. And Connie and Al said, well, come to my place, do it here. <laughs> and that's basically how it started. Will be, I think, a, a good addition to, yeah. to travel with the house over the years. And we're very proud of it, that we've been able to add this to Keyhole Castle. The floor of the ballroom is, is a maple finished hardwood. And we understand that under the floor, there's a, a cushioning effect uh, provided by a layer of horsehair. The top of the turret on the third floor was where we understand the maid lived. And there are a couple of small alcoves off of each of the corners. And then a passageway that goes along the east side of the home. But that's where the coats were hung for the guests that came to the various parties and functions that were held in the ballroom. The, the Moorish influence would be the closest uh, contributor or most likely contributor to the choice of all of these keyhole windows. They're, they're certainly an interesting architectural feature that, uh, that has caught the attention of uh, passers-by for, for decades. The chandelier over here is paper mache covered with gold leaf. The room contains the last uh, intercom station. There were originally five in the house. Before having our son, we had some parties and gatherings with friends up there uh, quite regularly. Uh, when he came along, it suddenly turned into a, a play area and a children's room. We always liked coming up here to the ballroom. Uh, it's There's the different little cubby holes with the different windows and you could climb in, in through the doors there and in, in the dress up room with all the, and mirrors on all the doors. And so that was always fun. They can come up here, turn the music up as loud as they like, and you can't hear it on the first or second floor. If you have a billiard room or a dance floor on the top floor, the privacy is endangered by the people as guests walking up through the house, through the living space, through the bedroom space, up into the upper floor. And yes, this seems to be a strange location, but 
perhaps if one stops for a moment and thinks about the practicality of structure, uh, then in an open space you don't really need any walls or columns. And the only space within the building that uh, you have the luxury of removing walls and columns is perhaps on the top floor. With the improvements in the mural, we've uh, tried to make it more of an adult space for us yeah. now in the, in the later years. And uh, uh, the acoustics, because I think of the dome, are uh, fabulous up here for music. So it's just a wonderful place to sit, listen to music and, uh, and uh, reflect on the art. Back in the teens and twenties, uh, there were many uh, notable functions here and dance cards would be filled and live orchestras would be playing and uh, you can sit up here and just imagine the swirling dresses and, and excited people uh, gathering here with the carriages and horses parked outside. It's absolutely essential that the home remain as close to the way it is as possible. It's a, a very unique slice of Prince Albert and Saskatchewan's history. Whatever uh, succession occurs down the road, whether it be a private ownership situation or, or some sort of public use or even commercial use, that, that the essential uh, key point of all of that would be uh, to preserve and maintain uh, the, the property as close to original as possible. It's surprising to me that uh, there is such a house in Prince Albert, not to, not to be negative at all to Prince Albert, but uh, to find it uh, in Canada, to find such a quality building as that, and of course the the person that uh, developed this, Mr. McLeod, good for him for developing something like this as an example that really we could all follow. So hopefully with some foresight and with some understanding of our own history and the significance of what we still yet have, we can maintain and even beautify the buildings that uh, we have inherited as a city. We've loved living here. The novelty hasn't worn off yet. It truly is something that uh, when you walk in the door, you know you're somewhere special.